What should you do when you find stories and teachings in the Bible that seem strange and offensive? Should we just discard them as out of date? Or can we still find wisdom in it? That's a great question, and I think there are good answers coming up. One comment I sometimes hear about the Bible is that it's outdated. They say something like, well, I can't believe the Bible is divinely inspired because of its outdated science and primitive morality. We just can't believe that stuff anymore. And people are really quick to jump on this. They read something that seems out of step with today's moral intuitions, and they say, see, I told you Christianity can't be right. But I think Pastor Tim Keller gives some great guidance when we run into passages like this. He says that when we come across teachers, he says that when we come across teachings that offend us, before we write it off, we should first consider three things. First, we should consider that the Bible not, might not teach what we think it teaches. And to make an example, he uses and he uses the example of polygamy. And he uses and he uses polygamy as an example. Polygamy is the practice of having more than one wife, which seems to make the man the center of everything and privileges men at the expense of women. And of course, we can't accept that today. But Keller points out that if you really read scripture, while the Old Testament talks about polygamy, in every generation, polygamy is always a complete disaster in every way. You don't find stories of a healthy polygamous family in the Bible even though it talks about it and might even allow it in a culture where men often died young and women had few options outside of marriage. It's never advocated as the ideal. Second, he says to consider that we might understand Second, he says that we should consider that we might misunderstand what the Bible is teaching because of our cultural blinders. A few years ago, my small group was studying the book of 1 Timothy, and some of the women in our group, after reading chapter 2, came to small group, and they were utterly offended. Here's why. Listen to this passage. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, many of the women were, you can understand it, appalled by this, and they were ready to throw their Bible out the window. Of course, the men joked, preach it, right? But this is one of those cases where when you understand the cultural context, you start to understand the passage a little better. Now, first of all, we know that there must be another explanation besides sexism because we know from other places in Scripture that the Apostle Paul actually trained women to be teachers. But this passage seems to be so clear. Women shouldn't teach in the church. But of course, when we know the context, we understand better what Paul was saying. So let me give you some context that Paul doesn't explain to us but Timothy would have understood. You see, the city of Ephesus was the center of worship of the goddess Artemis. All worshipers of Artemis were female. It was a, a feminist religion. She was the goddess of the hunt, the moon, and chastity, and women looked to her for protection during pregnancy and childbirth. Now, many of the women in the church would have been either coming out of the cult of Artemis or were Christians who were influenced by the worshipers of Artemis. In chapter 1, when Paul tells Timothy not to let people in his church devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies or old wives' tales, he was referring to the cult of Artemis. So then in chapter 2, Paul says that he doesn't allow women to take authority over a man. Now, this isn't the neutral word for authority. It's a word that's only used one time in the Bible, and it basically means a hostile takeover or to enslave the other. Now, of course, Paul wouldn't permit this, and he also wouldn't permit a man to do that to a woman either. 
later on in chapter 2 and verse 14, he refers to the creation story in Genesis because there was a Gnostic retelling of Genesis where Eve was depicted as the feminine spiritual power and represented the source of spiritual awakening. But Paul combats this by saying, no, here's what it says. Adam was created first and then Eve. And Eve wasn't perfect. She was a sinner just like Adam. And verse 15 is the one that really gets women. Women will be saved through childbirth. Now, this is just a misunderstanding of what it's saying. Okay, it's not saying that childbirth will be the means of women's salvation. One of the reasons why women joined the Artemis cult was that it promised them safe pregnancy and childbirth. But Paul is saying, you don't need Artemis for this. All you need to do is to continue to do what Christ calls you to do, and God will take care of you. Today, it seems weird to us because it's addressing issues that we don't have. We don't understand because we have cultural blinders. The third thing that Keller says to consider that says, the third thing that Keller says to consider when we run into passages that seem out of date to us is that we may be getting offended by some biblical teaching because of an unexamined assumption that our cultural understanding is superior. Now, we live in a society that almost always believes that newer is better. Okay, this is the unexamined mindset of our culture. In fact, we idolize youth culture so much that while other cultures revere and look to the older generation for wisdom, we tend to discard them as out of touch. When people question whether a societal change is good, we're quick to tell them that they're on the wrong side of history. Inevitably, there will be passages of scripture that people in today's society will have trouble with and others that we'll be fine with. But if you go to another culture, they'll be fine with the one that troubles us and we'll be scandalized with teachings that we think are fine. Why should we assume that our culture... So, why should we assume that our culture is right and the other cultures are wrong? For instance, our individualistic culture thinks the Bible's view of sex is repressive and unhealthy and dangerous. But we like the passages about forgiving our enemies. Other cultures, like in the Middle East, will be fine with passages about sex. In fact, they're probably not strict enough. But the Bible's teaching on forgiving your enemies is scandalous. That's crazy. If you live that way, people will eat you alive. So the question is, is it possible that we're offended, not because the Bible is outdated, but but because we lack perspective? This is what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery, or what we might call cultural snobbery. Why should our cultural sensibilities trump everyone else's? Why should you disbelieve the Bible because it offends your culture? Actually, this is the advantage of a book that's 3,000 years old that was written over the course of 1,500 years in a number of different cultures. Maybe it just has a perspective that we don't have when we assume that everything in our culture is progress. Maybe, just maybe, the Bible has something to say to us, not despite its ancient roots, but because of them. 